Hi everybody, it's meteorologist Joe Chaffee on this Friday, the eve of Christmas Eve, and a lot of folks are running around. I was too a little earlier, so I'm kind of trying to squeeze things in today with videos and a couple of posts. Um, gradually, during the Christmas period, I kind of slowed down a little bit, but I've got some time, so we're going to look at the models today. One of the things I find you know, really challenging about the wintertime is how uh, models evolve and change. And then, you know, you suddenly, when you think you have it all figured out, it goes back to something it showed days before. And we seem to be in a, a, a state of confusion that began last night with the European run. And just to review, the European run was one of the, was the, one of the first models to telegraph this idea that we're going to go uh, and get, uh, deal with some colder air late beginning late next week and beyond and then the gfs went along um, now the europeans got a slightly different version of what it wants to do and the gfs is kind of sticking to its idea in terms of the cold so i'm going to illustrate here what i'm talking about first off weather this weekend other than that little interruption of rain that we get tomorrow you can just pick out a little bit of an indentation here in the upper flow and you know that's a, a week weather system that's uh, come out of the southwest and then you have this other trough that's out in the west and you know the flow across Canada there really isn't a whole lot of cold air actually because a big high is going to be building up to our north some colder air is going to be uh, bleeding down uh, beginning late tomorrow and through Sunday into early Monday so the bottom layer of the atmosphere actually won't be that warm we'll probably have a tough time getting above 40 on Sunday on Christmas Day but there'll be plenty of sunshine and the air will be dry. The rain for tomorrow should be moving out uh, in short order. So I'm going to just address that issue at this point, and we'll then go into the long range. So let's um, let's take a look at the uh, NAM model and tropical tidbits adjusted now. And I'm really thrilled about this because you know, I was having a really difficult time using the, the their, his the version of the the NAM. Uh, because of what it was showing as radar echoes, and more often than not, that it wasn't really reaching the ground. But um, now um, uh, Levi uh, Levi Cowan, who's um, uh, who runs Tropical Tidbits, uh, adjusted it so we're we're actually seeing the uh, actual radar, the ground reflection, uh, more than what we're seeing in terms of the composite, where they're taking like every echo there is and putting it together. So. Now we're getting a real view of what the radar is supposed to look like, and, and it's much more productive here. So uh, when we look at the NAM, NAM's a little slower in bringing uh, precipitation in, uh, brings it in around daybreak uh, or a little bit before across southern Pennsylvania, south central Pennsylvania into north central Maryland. That, that rain comes in probably around 2 or 3 a.m., and it reaches New York City uh, by uh, 7 a.m. and then over Long Island by 9 or 10 o'clock, and then it goes out. So weather conditions begin to improve during the late morning across south central Pennsylvania and north central Maryland, that area uh, around or just after lunchtime in New York City and probably around mid-afternoon uh, from west to east across Long Island and southern New England as that moves away. And then you can see there's a big high right up here that builds down for Christmas Day. So we really have no issues, but that's a cold flow of air that's coming down from eastern Canada. Here's the blizzard that's going to be affecting the Dakotas and northern Minnesota and, and and moving on northeast from there. They're going to get some pretty decent snows out of this. When we uh, take a look at the uh, NAM model snow forecasts of total snowfall, uh, there are some amounts approaching 10, 12 inches up here. This is all going to be very, very fast. And there's also going to be for tomorrow with the rain that's here in the south and some of the areas to the north and upstate New York and into um, interior New England, uh, probably a one to three, two to four inch snowfall from that. And not to leave out the rest of the nation, I will show you the whole country on the NAM. So white Christmas for all these areas here shaded in, the, I would say in the darkest blues, it'll just be some snow that appears, but uh, this is through Tuesday. So let's back it up uh, at least up until 1 a.m., this is snow that's forecast to fall uh, cumulatively. Does he have a 24-hour? Let's see. Does he have a 24-hour snowfall? 
No, he doesn't. So this is cumulative snowfall between now and Sunday. But you know what? In my view, it counts. If it snows on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day or both, uh, it counts for a white Christmas. If there's snow on the ground where you are, it counts as a white Christmas too. So there you have it across the country. Um, what's going to be happening snow-wise uh, for this weekend? Okay, so let's go switch off to the long range now because that's the one where we always have the most fun, <laughs> okay? Uh, and certainly for me as a forecaster, the most torture. Uh, but we'll take a look at the upper air. I'm going to start with the GFS model today. And so we're through the weekend and into early next week. Big ridge in the east. Here's that blizzard that lifts up really pretty far to the west and heads up into uh, southeastern Canada. So all that pushes through in the east is a cold front with maybe a couple of showers, if that. And then you start to get this strengthening vortex, which by the end of the week is beginning to bring down colder air. And, you know, it's, it's pretty evident here with the flow and you got these weather systems, these troughs out um, in the Pacific. That was a mistake on my part. So let me just un, unzoom it and we'll do it again. Uh, so here's a trough in the east. You've got this. You've got that. Um, you've got also a very big ridge that's beginning to build and this is the signature ridge uh that we're looking at uh in the um that builds up into the, the gulf of alaska and up through alaska we also have ridging right here in the atlantic along 55 west that's building northward and then there's another ridge you can't see it but it's actually east of this upper low um east of greenland so there's a lot happening in terms of the change in the overall profile. So what the GFS does is pretty much what the European was doing through yesterday, and now it's kind of done a little, something a little bit different, in that that first vortex, the kind of that first arm just sort of lifts up and out, and then you have this second stronger arm that drops in for New Year's Day and the first uh, two or three days of January. You know, And this is a pretty cold shot of air that that uh, is being telegraphed here you know you've got the vortex actually does lift out uh I keep picking the wrong colors i'm sorry i meant to go with the black one okay so there you go and then you have this you know ridging that's building up toward greenland up here you've got the ridge that's up building up into alaska and you know basically this is kind of what i would refer to we used to call it the broad bowl flow where it's just a sort of broad uh trough that looks like a bowl and, and, and you really don't get uh, strong systems. Now, beyond the 10-11 day period, what the model eventually winds up doing is trying to drop a trough down in the west. And you can see it here. You know, the flow in Canada suddenly becomes, you know, you still have this cross-polar flow that comes out of Canada, but it mainly gets contained in northern Canada and, and, and into southeastern Canada. And then you have another ridge that pops up in the east. I would suggest, and I said this in one of my posts yesterday on Facebook, I think we really need to keep an open mind on how this all plays out. Uh, this is not a point. There's, a, there's just way too much volatility. I'm not even talking about the model volatility. I think there's just way too much atmospheric volatility going on between you know, strong ridges and, 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 and deep troughs and vortexes forming and, and, and strengthening and weakening that I, I think it's really sending models for a loop in the, in the longer term. So, you know, I, I, we can't look at these things, especially after the, de the t I don't even think we could look inside the seven-day period, late in the seven-day period. We can't look at these things as literal gospel. There's just too much happening. So you get the, the GFS's idea here. Now I'm going to show you the European, because the European went a little different, and I'm not sure yet what the longer-term implications of this, because I don't know if the outcome is going to be the same now, what the European does with this first vortex is that it, it brings it to southeastern Canada, and instead of lifting it up, it actually stretches it out, and you have a trough that extends down right along the coast. This is for New Year's Eve, um, and you can see it right here. So that's a much different view than the GFS, which when I, I'll show you by comparison. Uh, here, that's the European in front of you, and here's the GFS. Okay, European, GFS. Okay, so the GFS actually makes more of the second vortex and less of the first, where the first one just lifts out, the second one strengthens. The European, on the other hand, 
makes war with the first, and then when we move through time, the second one just kind of gets left behind instead of coming down. You basically transition over into kind of a westerly flow. This is, you know, I'm not, again, I'm not sure where we go from here because when we look at the structure, you've got this activity going on in the west. You've got this big upper high that's building up across Alaska, but now we also have this big upper high on the European that's building up across uh, the Atlantic along 40 west and up into Greenland. Now, this is a position where if it uh, continues uh, to build across the poles like this, that you could wind up with basically higher pressures across all of the poles and some kind of vortex that finds its way to the south. And then the flow uh, essentially that gets established will be um, across, you know, a, a strong cross polar flow in the long term. But that's one possibility. There are other things that could happen here. You know, you could have, you know, this upper high may not, they may not build across the top and perhaps you'll get a deep trough that forms out in the west and starts to pop that ridge up again in the eastern states and kind of keeps the cold air locked up in Canada again for a little while. So, you know, I think there's a lot of uncertainty here in terms of where we go, we're going. And by the way, that uncertainty also now extends uh, into the short range. And I want to just show you what the, what the European did today. Now, you can't see, unfortunately, I wish I could show it to you, but I can't. Um, but I'm going to do the best I can to illustrate what the European uh, did do today um, with because of the fact that it puts so much emphasis on that first uh, trough that you wind up with something coming out of the plains and into the Ohio Valley. And gradually, this is for next Thursday, by the way, and it redevelops it right along the coast and strengthens it so that eventually you wind up with a deep low in, in the Gulf of Maine. The European actually has a substantial snowfall for much of the interior northeast for Thursday, next Thursday, into Thursday night, into Friday. And in fact, uh, it even has it cold enough where it has significant snows falling even down to the coast, depending on whose snow model map you use. Okay, that's the Europeans' view. The GFS's view is, of course, because we can't have some sense of of continuity. Figures all the time. One point that the models finally all agreed with each other on certain things, and then they wound up going in this direction. But when we look at the GFS. The GFS doesn't do that because it doesn't put really emphasis on the first vortex. It puts more emphasis on the second. So it has a basically has a cold front coming through here on Thursday that just moves along. And then as we go through the weekend, when that second vortex drops down, that's when you get the cold air. So this is where the GFS now makes more of the second thing, where it has a wave that... Here's the kind of an Arctic, you know, an Arctic front with a wave on it, and the wave develops down in the south and then runs up to the northeast. Now, one of the things that I would point out, if this possibility were real, is that um, if this first system in the north winds up being faster where it outruns the south, that uh, could mean for a colder look here in the east uh, where the wave winds up being a little further south and we have rain changing over to accumulating snow. I think that's a, a the possibility based on what the GFS is showing. I don't know that I believe this scenario, okay? because of the fact that we've got the models now doing really two different things. The European kind of wants to do this on Thursday uh, with the first thing because it doesn't have much of a vortex with the second thing. So if you're following my logic along here, okay, it's really, it's, it's not easy. And by the way, let's look across the country, and I'm going to do the Canadian Maritimes also, so don't, I didn't forget you, okay? So as we look across the country uh, throughout much of next week, let me just back it up. So we have this system on Tuesday that doesn't do much. You've got another system coming in the Pacific Northwest that's not as strong as the one that we're seeing um, for uh, today that winds up evolving into a, a blizzard. So that kind of keeps much of the country fairly quiet. Then you can see that descending high with that shot of cold air. That's a pretty strong shot of cold air that moves up into the northern plains and then eventually into the east. So the... The pattern uh, flip that the GFS is telegraphing would quiet things down a little bit in the west until the end of the period. And you can still see, you know, weather systems coming through in the east. 
So, you know, it has some action again toward the end of the period with that troughing in the West. I don't know that I believe this look at all. So, you know, I, I in fact, I can tell you, I, I don't believe it. Um, I don't believe how the models are taking this. I think, I think it's uh, not a good idea to, to look at this and say un unequivocally that this is going to happen in, in a certain way. There's just too much going on. Okay, let me take care of my buddies up in the Canadian Maritimes. And you know what? One of these days, you know, I'm, I have never been up into the into that area. I want to go to Nova Scotia. I want to go to Newfoundland. One of these days, I am going to do this, okay? So let's see what kind of Christmas you guys are going to have. So let's back this up and let's take a look. So we'll go to... Um, We'll start with today. Let me just okay. I mean, so you can see the date and time. So this is tonight. So we have some areas getting snow. Uh, Nova Scotia in rain Saturday night. Uh, Newfoundland, the northern half, uh, has some snow with rain to the south. You can see the low goes by to your west and kind of starts to stretch out and redevelops. So at some point, the warm air will get cut off. So produces some snow uh, on and off through Christmas. Uh, into the next day. That's a nice little shot there. And then we've got this high that builds in. Now here comes the system again, assuming the GFS is right on this. Looks like you're going to get into some snow and rain on uh, Tuesday. Low pressure develops over Newfoundland. You get changed back to snow in the colder air. And then next Thursday, now the GFS would, because it has that weaker system, would have this look um for you which is another one of these snow to rain situations but if the european is correct with a deep low in the gulf of maine then you know you might wind up with a significant snowstorm up uh, throughout parts of southeastern canada i would advise that the G the european one of the arguments for me against the european is the fact that the european has continually made these deep snowstorms that I mean these deep storms whether they be snow or not since October and I don't know if this has anything to do with the um the upgrade they did but it's made a number of intense storms uh, in terms of pressures that have not ha that have never happened okay in fact this blizzard uh, that we're getting uh this storm that's back out in the west is really the first one where the models have actually gotten it right with regards to um uh, the, the the pressure and the depth of the storm. Uh, so I don't know if that's going to be mean an overall change of things. Maybe with all this atmospheric turmoil, certainly it should be ripe for a deepening storm somewhere. But I'm I'm skeptical. By the way, it, we'll finish off today. These are the above and below normal temperatures. So it's the GFS, you know, it has. Uh, you have to wait for that first system, which doesn't do much. But then right after that goes by, you start to see this sort of expanding area of below normal temperatures that takes you through much of next week, uh, much of the first week of January. So now we're into January 7th. And, you know, then as that trough gets established more in the West, um, you start to see some moderation in the East, but it's still co co pretty cold across most of Canada. So at least that part of the equation, the model seems to have uh, done, uh, you know, shown a, a significant change. And just to show you the difference with the European, and we'll finish off that way and you know we're still below normal at day 10 because the europeans look is just different it's you know it seems to me like it has much more of a blocky look and by the way you can see up here all through the polar regions how temperatures are running above normal this is a signature that the, the european is trying to build this basically this, this this high that envelopes around uh the poles and you know let me just show you here so you know you've got you know, basically higher pressures all around the poles like this. So, you know, your vortexes are going to be, you know, much further south with your colder air. And the flow winds up being, you know, cross-polar. Maybe that that might be a little bit overdone, but, you know, winds up being cross-polar over time on, on the, the European. Who knows? Okay. But you know what I do know? I do know that it's Christmas and that it's also Hanukkah on Saturday. So, Let's uh, focus on the fact that I want you to have a merry, merry Christmas to you and to all your families. I put up a little Christmas card video that I did. You can see my dog and my cat in it. 
Um, but I, I really want to wish all of you that use my YouTube channel a very, very Merry Christmas. Enjoy your families. Enjoy the good food that you do. Um, you know, if you attend, I, I, I sing in my church choir at St. Elizabeth Ann Seton in Lake Ronkonkoma. I'm a tenor. Uh, this is uh, um, my second favorite Mass of the year. Um, my favorite is the Easter Vigil because the music is so intense. And um, I have actually, I do, there are parts that I do on uh, Christmas Eve to Silent Night and to O Come All Ye Faithful. So, you know, when you put a tenor in center stage, he's very happy, especially if he can one up a soprano. So um, have a great, great Christmas and a great holiday. I'll keep you abreast of the weather. I'll squeeze in some videos when I can. And I hope Santa Claus brings you what you want.